Ford TTB gets a bad rap, but in my opinion, just like every other suspension setup, there's pros and there's cons. And we're gonna deal with some of the cons. Today, I'm gonna try and fix the thing that causes the biggest number of headaches for people, in my opinion, which is the steering. Let's get the steering set up on this 12 valve Cummins Explorer. Hello builders and makers, welcome back to Build Theory where I show you my build process in order to encourage and enable your own projects. This thing has three quarter ton axles front and rear with a TTB setup out of an F250 in this little Explorer. It's also on lift coils out of an F150, so it's a pretty tall front end, pretty big axle, and it's got big 37s on it. That's a recipe for some issues with the TTB steering and suspension. So let's talk about what a lift can do to your steering. As your suspension cycles, the TTB travels through an arc and as the axles travel through an arc, so does the steering. Where you run into issues is if the steering is traveling through a different arc than the axles are, because when that happens, something's gotta give, and what gives is that the tire turns. This means that you're getting dynamic steering input just from your suspension traveling up and down, and that's no good. When you hear about people putting a lift on their Ford TTB and suddenly it chews up all their tires, they can never figure out how to make it not chew up their tires. This is the biggest cause of that, in my opinion, is the steering. Take a look at these tie rods right now. They are not at the same angle that the axle is, and that is the cause of all this concern. The axles travel through a different arc than the tie rods do. No bueno. Now there's a couple ways to attempt to fix this problem. The first way is if I take the point that the tie rod connects to the steering box and move it lower, I start to get a better angle here. These angles start to match. So one thing you can do is just move this point higher or lower until those are parallel. The way you do that is with a dropped pitman arm. This is what a stock pitman arm looks like. This end connects to the steering box and then this end connects to the tie rod. This is what a pitman arm looks like with a four inch drop. I've been known to add a couple inches to a tape measure, but that is nowhere near a four inch drop if you ask me. This isn't just a product of this particular company that's making this. These advertised drops on these pitman arms are never as advertised. So a four inch drop is more like a one or two inch drop. So if you're putting a four inch lift on your vehicle and you use this pitman arm, you're still two inches shy of stock geometry. So these drop pitman arms are really useful, but don't expect that they're gonna completely fix your problem. I am going to use this drop pitman arm, but there's something else you can do to get a lot more height back to get it a lot closer to that stock geometry that actually works. Now, the next thing that you can do to get a couple inches back is what if I take this tie rod that connects to the bottom of this steering knuckle and flip it over so it connects to the top of the steering knuckle? That'll give me a couple inches, right? That would definitely give me a couple inches, but there's one big issue here. This only goes in one way. Let's talk about how I'm actually gonna go about flipping this tie rod from the bottom of the steering knuckle to the top of the steering knuckle and how I'm gonna button up the suspension and make it work. There's definitely some tricks here that aren't so obvious when you first start thinking about this. This is the stock tie rod end. If you look real close, this part's tapered. So the problem is, if I have a tapered hole like this, and I take it from this direction, and I try and flip it upside down and stick it in this direction, it doesn't fit, it gets stuck right here. So I need to sort out this whole taper situation. One thing that people do is they just drill it out straight and then instead of using a taper joint like this, they just shove a bolt in it and then put a heim on it. A heim joint setup like this is fine, except the problem is if you have a hole like this with a bolt in it and it's constantly moving back and forth, eventually it gets wallowed out. So if we're looking at the top of it, you got a hole like this, a bolt in the center. As it moves left and right, what was a circle starts to become an oval. Then you get slop in your steering. So heim joint setup isn't optimal. The purpose of this taper is that it's actually an interference fit. What that means is that when I thread the bolt on that here, it sucks this taper into that taper, pushes it apart, and now you have that force squeezing down on the taper. That force squeezing down on the taper means that up here, you're not just getting contact on one side and on the other side, you're getting contact the whole way around because that's the interference, it's squeezing it apart. This is why taper fits are used on steering components. They're actually a lot safer and a lot better because they don't waller out the hole. We wanna keep a taper. You don't have to. On a race truck, they use Himes all the time. For a street truck, 
probably want to keep your taper. With this build, I'm going for both serviceability and reliability. And this is why I'm choosing to use tapered ball joints, similar to stock, rather than using heim joints. You have to weigh serviceability, reliability, and performance. So how do you keep your taper? Well, one thing you can do, you can take a tapered reamer and you can come in the top and you can actually ream this out. So that the taper on the top matches the taper on the bottom. The only issue is when you do this, once you take a tapered reamer and ream the top of your steering knuckle, what you end up with is not a perfectly tapered hole, you end up with this hourglass shaped hole. This hourglass shape will work fine at first. Your tie rod will sit in there and everything will be fine, but this gives you way less meat holding onto this taper and eventually this will probably wall her out too because there's just not as much material there. Reaming it out is an okay solution, but it's not a perfect solution. The easiest solution in my opinion and what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna take this taper, drill it out, to where it's a straight hole. And then I'm going to put an insert in this straight hole that has my taper. That's what this is. The inside of this is tapered. It fits perfectly on the end of this tie rod. The outside of this is not tapered. It's just a straight hole. So what I can do is take my three quarter inch drill bit, drill through the steering knuckle, and then put this in its place. This will make it so that my tie rod doesn't wall around the hole because it still has that tapered interference fit, but it'll also make it so that I have the most amount of meat possible. Plus it's a whole lot cheaper than that tapered reamer, which is like a hundred dollar tool. So these inserts are what I'm going to use. I got these on rough stuff. You can also get them from Bronco Graveyard. I'm going to give this a go and see what happens. The other thing to keep in mind here is if I'm going through all this work and modifying it, I don't necessarily have to use the stock size taper anymore. If I'm gonna be drilling it out and putting an insert in, I can use whatever size insert I want. So I'm actually gonna switch over to this larger tie rod end. This is an F250 tie rod end. This is the tie rod end out of a GM one ton. It seems like the threads on this side on F250s, F150s, Explorers, and GMs, all these tie rod threads here seem to be the exact same. So you never run into an issue there. Just make sure you're getting right or left hand depending which side it's going on. This is the part that's different. This is a lot bigger on the GM one ton ends and these you can get in any part store. So it's nice to run these because they're cheap and they're a lot tougher. If you're gonna be modifying it, you might as well upgrade it. Additionally, Rough Stuff actually sells one that has this one inch offset. On my particular build, I don't have a lot of room for the steering box. So this one inch offset is gonna help my steering actually fit under the car without running into the axle. On a lot of other vehicles, when you have a diff cover and everything on the front of it, sometimes you wanna move your steering away from that diff cover. So this offset is gonna come in useful for me. It does mean it's not a off the shelf part anymore, but I could always put in an off the shelf, just straight one if I was in an emergency. So if this is where the steering sat naturally, the one inch offset would move it right there and give me a little bit more clearance between the diff cover and the tie rod end. Or in my case, give me a little more room to mount the steering box. Let's do this tie rod flip. So I got these seven eighths holes drilled and now these spacers fit in here. I was thinking about running a weld bead around here to make sure that these stay in. And then I realized these are a little more clever than I first gave them credit for. You see how it's actually a split sleeve? What that means is that when I put this tie rod end in, which is tapered, and I run this nut down, as it goes onto there, it opens up to accept the taper. Because it opens up to accept the taper, it pushes up against the steering knuckle here. So I'm actually getting that interference fit that I was talking about earlier with this thing just by tightening the nut down. That's good. And it also means if I run a bead around that, it's not going to do that. I'm just gonna leave this as is. My only concern is that if I ever have to take these off, it'll be permanently stuck onto here and I won't be able to get it off. So it might be a good idea to get some spares of these, but for now, this will work fine. Let's get these tie rods on the car. Turns out this isn't gonna work at all. Apparently, the tie rod that goes in this end and the tie rod that goes in the other end are a different size. This one's a lot smaller. Additionally, as I was looking more into it, I realized that these one ton GM tie rod ends, I thought that they just spun right into these Ford tie rod connectors, but they don't. Even though they'll twist on with a little bit of force, these are actually a metric thread and these are an SAE thread. So these don't technically go together. Now they'll spin together 
because the thread side is just so close. But since it's a steering component, I don't wanna mess around with it. I want to make sure I have the actual right thread. So I need to find a way to adapt the smaller thread to the bigger tie rod end. And I also need to adapt it from metric on the Ford side to SAE on the GM side. If you were to stick with just Ford tie rod ends, then you wouldn't have to make these custom connectors I'm gonna make. However, in my case, I already adapted the steering knuckles to GM parts. So that's why I need to make these custom connectors. Keep in mind that the Ford tie rod ends and the GM tie rod ends will take a different size steering knuckle adapter, so plan accordingly. A quick note on those taper measurements I just gave. Tie rod ends are measured in taper per foot, which is odd because that's actually based on the diameter. It is not based on the radius. So if we take a look at the tie rod end and we're interested in the tapered section right here, if we want to take our measurements on this section, typically in order to do the calculation or the measurement to get this angle, you would use radiuses. And when you do the math, you would come out with three 3.56 degrees, but I told you it was 7.125 degrees. The reason why is because taper per foot uses diameter. You combine this angle with this angle up here. So if you do the trig the normal way, you get half the angle you're meant to. This threw me off a lot because online told me it was supposed to be 7.125 degrees, and when I measured it, it always came out to half that. So I figured I'd explain why in case this confused anybody else. Taper per foot uses the diameter, not the radius and the value works out to twice what you would expect it to be. Luckily, there's been a little bit of time travel since the last time we talked. I realized I had that issue with the tie rods about two or three weeks ago. Since then, I had a bad sinus infection, I was on antibiotics and out of the garage for a week, and then my partner had a surgery and I've been taking care of her. So the good news is, in that time, I already got parts in to fix this. Let's look at what I'm planning to do. I think the solution to this problem is I'm just gonna remake these connectors, but I'm gonna make them into an adapter. I'm gonna make it go from metric on the one side, the Ford side, to SAE on the other side, the GM side. In order to do this, I got some quarter inch wall tubing. That's gonna make up the body of the connector. And then for all you guys that were telling me I should just use some weld-in bungs rather than making my own stuff, I'm finally gonna do that. I'm gonna do that because these are tie rods and that is a lot thicker than just the nut and I want as much thread engagement as possible on steering stuff. I can make this slide into one end, I can drill it out and make the bigger one slide in the other end, and then I've also got these little guys, which are the SAE size. These one ton tie rod ends are turning into a lot more work to use than I thought they would. I thought they would just screw in. It would have been a lot easier if I just stuck with the four tie rod ends and they probably would have been fine. But unfortunately, I already drilled out the steering knuckle for these, so there's no going back now. I still think in the end this will be a good setup because I'll still have off-the-shelf parts for all my wearable components. The only part that's going to be custom is my adapter here, and this isn't gonna be a wear component. Still think it's gonna be a good solution because maintenance matters and being able to replace this stuff is nice. And I still think these tapered ends are good to have for steering, for longevity. It is more work than I thought it was gonna be initially. All right, this is how this turned out. So I've got standard on one side, metric on the other. It needs a lick of paint and it needs a jam nut for the metric side, which I don't have. For now, let's throw it on, get it mocked up, see if it's gonna work. And later I'll throw another jam nut on it and paint it. Now that the tie rod connectors are finished, it's time to move on to the next problem that's gonna stop the steering in this Cummins Explorer from working. My problem is that I put a Cummins in this little Explorer and right there, where that giant engine mount is, that's where my steering box is supposed to go. I put the Cummins mounts right where my steering box goes, which means I can't use a stock steering box on this. In fact, I can't use any steering box that goes on the inside of the frame. There just isn't enough room with the Cummins in here. Luckily, Ford made a lot of vehicles in their day, and some of those vehicles, like the 78 to 79 Bronco, came with a steering box that goes on the outside of the frame. So the way I'm gonna fix my steering box issue is I bought a 78 to 79 Bronco steering box. I'm gonna mount it on the outside of the frame, and that means I actually have room for this thing. It also means that I've moved my, uh, my steering shaft over and I'm gonna have to move it back and I'm gonna have to find a way to mount this to the frame in the right position but 
I can figure all that out. This is the steering box that I ended up using. Because I put the steering box on the outside of the frame, this connector needs to be a little longer than that connector. I have this thing clamped exactly where I want it. Now I just need to mark these holes on here. Here's a quick trick if you don't have the right size transfer punch in order to mark this. You can just take the bolt that you're gonna put in it, add something brightly colored like some anti-seize or maybe a yellow paint pen or something to the end of it. Then you just go in and mark it like that. And now you have the spot to center punch it once you pull that part off. There it is with the steering pump removed and you can very obviously see the spots of anti-seize. There's two things I need to deal with up here. First off, when I turn this tire, if I were to tighten this bolt up all the way, this steering arm would actually run into the frame. So I need to clearance this frame here a little bit. I've got one other issue that's unique to me because I'm mixing and matching so many different parts. Half my steering's from an F250, half of it's from an Explorer. It's kind of a weird situation. This is the stock Pittman arm and this is the drop Pittman arm, and that hole there is actually different. And then eventually I actually need to connect all of this to the steering wheel, so a steering shaft will have to come too. This is what it looks like moving side to side. Full bump passenger and full bump driver. Now it's not 100% full bump. I can just barely put my finger between the bump stop on the steering knuckle to the arm. So there is a tiny bit more travel that I could get out of it. But the issue is, I ran out of steering angle on the steering box. So it's not my tie rods that are the issue, it's actually the steering box. If I wanted slightly more steering angle, it's gonna have to be a new longer pitman arm so I get a little more length to get all the way to the bump. So that's the tie rods as good as they can be for this setup and I'm happy with that. The last piece that I need to make is a steering shaft so I can actually connect the steering wheel to the steering box. This is the steering shaft from the Cummins powered truck and this fits on my steering box, which is great. The issue is that the length the shaft needs to be is about that long and it's about this long. So I'm gonna have to find a way to shorten this. Additionally, in the center of these shafts, it actually moves like that. It's a safety feature so that if you get in a front end, it can collapse and it doesn't have the steering wheel stab you in the chest. Let's figure out what's under all this plastic crap and let's figure out how I'm gonna make a steering shaft for this. I spent a bunch of time trying to piece together a steering shaft from all these parts I have sitting here, and I don't think I'm gonna be able to get it to work with these used parts. This is the fitting that goes on the power steering pump, and then this is the collapsible part of the shaft, and all I need is to connect this part of the shaft to the steering wheel using a universal joint. It's gotta actually have a joint on it. And there's a couple ways I could have done it. The old steering shaft from the Explorer has the proper connection I need to connect it to the steering wheel. However, it's got a rag joint in between, so I really didn't want to cut this and weld it onto here with the rag joint in between, because one, they're not very good, two, the only one I have is pretty worn out, and three, this is a wear component. I don't wanna go welding wear components onto my steering shaft because that makes them really hard to replace. In the end, I decided I'm just gonna have to order a U-joint. This type of shaft you see here, they call it a DD shaft, and that's because there's a D shape here and a D shape up here. It's just like a round three quarter inch shaft, except that they milled two flats onto it, and those flats help stop rotating. So you can buy universal joints for steering that just have a connection to a DD shaft on it. So that's what I'm gonna do. If I get a one inch DD shaft, then I can connect the universal joint here on one side, which goes on to the sliding steering shaft, and then the other side will connect to the steering wheel. I won't even have to do any welding and that side will work fine. It'll be a couple weeks shipping, but that's okay. So for now, that'll be steering shaft done. I will worry about putting that universal joint on this later. This is how the rest of the steering turned out. I got the GM one ton tie rod ends here. I've got these custom connectors that I made here in order to make the SAE thread pitch on the GM stuff connect to the metric thread pitch on the Ford stuff. Got a drop 
steering arm here that's connected to a steering box that's mounted to the outside of the frame from a 78 Bronco. This whole setup is pretty rigid. Not a lot of play in the steering, which is awesome. The best thing is it uses stock parts. If that tie rod there wears out, I just go and buy a tie rod for an F250 and swap the new one in. If the tie rod ends wear out, just buy some tie rod ends from a GM. This setup will work great, I think. The car is on jack stands right now, but the tie rods are reasonably parallel with the axles in the back. Honestly, ge the geometry of this, even though it's not perfect, it's better than most lifted TTBs end up being, because most lifted TTBs, those tie rods are not even close to parallel with the axle, which is how you get bump steer. All of this TTB steering stuff actually came out of an F250 to begin with. I made some custom radius arms and everything for it. So if that TTB stuff is something that interests you, then go ahead and take a look at my other TTB video where I made some custom radius arms to make this setup work. And thanks for hanging out with me in my garage today, and I hope to see you next time.